It's February 2015, and this is a wow signal burst, number four, Daniel Carton's latest paper on the Fermi Paradox. We first spoke to Daniel Carton last calendar year for Season 2, Episode 2, where he talked about his paper modeling the Fermi Paradox in the local solar neighborhood. Well, he's back with a new paper. This time, he turns it around, assumes the Fermi Paradox, and tries to put constraints on how likely it is that advanced technological civilizations, spaceflight-capable civilizations, arise in our local civil neighborhood. So I called him up and asked him to explain it to me. You have a new paper that just came out on the 22nd of January of this year called mm-hmm. The Upper Limits on the Probability of an Interstellar Civilization Arising in the Local Solar Neighborhood. We talked last year about your paper and about the Fermi paradox in the local solar neighborhood. This paper this paper follows up on that one? Yeah, so it, it kind of flips it around. The, the previous paper said, you know, if I have, if I look at all of the star systems within um, a certain distance of the solar system, and I assume that I, I plan an interstellar civilization in each of these, um, how likely is it that that civilization would reach our solar system if it had a certain... Uh, probability of launching spacecraft and then a certain technological ability to go so many light years or so many parsecs away, you know, star to star. This kind of flips it around and says, okay, if I know that, um, I can actually put a limitation on how many of those civilizations have actually arisen within the local solar neighborhood. In this paper, you introduce uh, something that looks a lot like the Drake equation. Yes. The, the, the variables that we don't know in the Drake equation have to do with the probability of life arising and the probability of a technological civilization arising. And mm-hmm. You're trying to constra- essentially constrain the product of those two, right? Is that? Yeah. Obviously, the Drake equation was a slightly different context because it was dealing with uh, civilizations that have radio communications. But I use a similar idea of saying, okay, like you said, the terms that we do know about, we know how many planets roughly are going to form around the star system because of space roads like Kepler. And we have models, at least, of how likely it is for those planets to be habitable, but we don't know how likely life is to arise on a habitable planet or a planet that we would consider habitable and how likely it is for that life to go forward. So what I do is I say, okay, so those are the unknown probabilities. What we do know, as far as as far as we can tell is that there's no civilization that's ever visited the solar system. So let's flip that fact around and put some bounds on the probability of the things that we don't know, the probability that life evolves on a habitable planet and becomes an interstellar civilization. Just as in your previous paper, you're using two new unknowns. Uh, One is the probability that the civilization will colonize, and the other one is the maximum range of a starship. Is that right? Yes, correct. And in even an earlier paper, you calculated that the maximum range of the starship would not have to be very many parsecs in order to be able to sort of build colonies and a network of colonies. I, I'm looking at figure one mm-hmm. of your paper. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of quantitatively the bottom line conclusion here that on one axis we see the maximum range of a starship, the other one uh, the probability of colonization? And under these contours, I guess the most interesting contour is the very, is the very lowest one where the the uh, the maximum possible probability of, of a spacefaring civilization arising it's 1.0 so that says you know beyond that right we we wouldn't we wouldn't expect to see a Fermi paradox we would so any anything if I understand it, anything above that line should have mm-hmm. reached us by now so assuming that the that life arises everywhere well you have to take it with a little bit of salt because um as I explained in the paper, this doesn't deal with the fact that, uh, you know, there, there, there's no time sense of what's going on here. It's basically saying if everybody started all at once, then yes, if I'm above that contour, if I have either spaceships that can go very far distances or I'm 
I want to colonize everything in sight, then I'm likely to see it. But if there's, you know, something that's often been discussed is the fact that we, we can't expect that every civilization is going to, you know, arise within say 10 years of ours. It's going to be more right. like millions of years or something like that. So, but with that caveat, yeah, that's the basic idea is that if we expect that, um, as, um, Sagan and Newman said, uh, back in the seventies, that it's likely that, um, the galaxy could be colonized within 10 million years. Then, you know, we should be seeing them if, if the probabilities are high or if the, the spacecraft can go very far. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I look at this graph and the the contour for 1.0, which basically means that everywhere that a spacefaring civilization civilization can arise, it does, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and 0.01 is not that high above it. Uh, it's a, you need to be a little bit more technically capable and a little bit more likely to colonize. But it seems to say that somewhere in that parameter space is there's a spot where given the caveats that you've just mentioned, uh, Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a spot that where the Fermi paradox might not be a paradox and we might not expect to have seen anybody yet. Right. So like you say, so if I have either civilization for whatever reason decide that, you know, home sweet home, they decide not to colonize anywhere. They colonize every few places, then they could arise everywhere in the galaxy and we would just never see them. Right. Uh, I mean, if I look on this chart, anybody who can build a five parsec starship, which, you know, is a pretty impressive achievement, I grant you. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to have one. Should, even if you're not very like, e- likely to, for life to arise on a planet and become technological yeah you just need a little bit more of a push and you should have arrived at earth at some point Uh, Mm -hmm. your zero zero three contour which means that most planets don't give rise to such civilizations you do have to have a at least about a three and a half parsec spaceship in order to in order to have any chance at all of arriving at earth now you you noted in your conclusion that you didn't take into account the relative motions of stars right do you think that's very likely to be an important factor? Well, again, I think this comes back to the the, the sense of time. That if if you have if you have a civilization that has been around for a long time but is not prone to colonize, and if you have you know if you wait a million years, you're going to have multiple star systems go past you. I mean, it, it's kind of surprising to me how quickly this happens. That we would expect the stars to be relatively fixed, and yet on the order of a thousand or tens of thousands of years, the nearest star to the solar system is actually going to change quite a number of times. So if you have a civilization where it's not prone to colonize, but you have all these stars that are going past it, then I, I think that there is a likelihood that that would have some effect onto it. Um, and of course, the question is, is how much? I, I really don't know. Maybe it has no effect at all, but um, it's certainly an interesting question to look at. Yeah, because I haven't seen anything in the literature about that. I, I uh... it, 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 does, it does it does make a bit of difference. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it seems like that there's either in the past or the future there's close encounters maybe half the distance that Alpha Centauri is right now. So it, it does it does have a significant change, especially mm-hmm. when, you know, if you have a spaceship that can get, you know, say you can develop a spaceship that can go two light years rather than four, we would be in trouble now. But if we waited 10,000 years or 100,000 years, maybe there would be a star that comes along and all of a sudden that starts the cascade and you go from there. I see. So you mentioned in, in your conclusion uh, that ideally we do a, a galaxy wide simulation. Is that feasible now? Um, not on my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly feasible. I and mean, there's, there's various techniques that can be used for this. Um, and I, I think it's an important question though, because it's, it's certainly possible that, um, one of the things that I mentioned in the paper that if you do actually, maybe more in the last paper that I talked about is the fact that if you're, if you're very chauvinistic for sun like stars and you insist that I want a star that looks exactly like the sun, they're much further away because red dwarfs are much more common. Um, Mm -hmm. And so there you had the issue that if, if your spacecraft can't go beyond a certain distance, you may have a very limited number of stars that you can get to, even though there may be, you know, hundreds of millions of them in the galaxy. And so that may be a cause where, going galactic with your uh, simulation may not actually make any difference. Um, So questions like that should be dealt with. Okay. Well, thanks so much for your time. Uh, All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.
This is your host, Paul Carr. This has been Burst Number 4 from the Wow Signal Podcast. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. Music kindly supplied by Jason Robinson. This podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike License.